again. Hi everyone, it's Charlie Tullick. I'm a Victorian AES uh, Regional Committee member and um, really the facilitator for tonight's session on Do No Harm Unintended Consequences. Uh, talking about the Water for Women um, Fund. So first I'd like to start by acknowledging today. So I'm on Green Warren Country in uh, Victoria and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, tonight's session has a panel focus, so you'll be hearing from several different speakers and I'll leave it to, to Stuart to really introduce the way that the session will, will operate. Um, but I will hand over to Stuart Rates, who's the Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning Manager for the Water for Women Fund. So Stuart has 15 years of experience as a Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning Specialist in a range of sectors, uh, including resource management, climate change and community development across the Asia Pacific region. Holds a Master's degree in Social Science, a Bachelor of Arts, First Class Honours in Sociology and a Graduate Certificate in Evaluation and he's been an AES Victorian committee member since 2018. So I'll hand over to Stu to, um, to lead today's session. Great, thank you, Charlie. Um, yeah, so um, as Charlie mentioned, our, today's topic is on um, monitoring unintended consequences. Um, so we're gonna approach this topic um, from a do no harm lens um, and yeah so we're, we're going to draw on our experience um, from the Water in Women um, Fund um, so I'll talk about the fund shortly um, but just before we get into that I'm just going to introduce my fellow presenters today so we have um, Joanna Mott um, so Joyce is the Jesse advisor um, with the Water for Women Fund um, I don't actually have your bio on hand here, Joyce. <laughs> so um, I might just run through everyone. Um, yeah. I think that's fine, Stuart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So jo yeah, Joyce is the Gender and Social Inclusion Advisor for the Water for Women Fund. Um, we also have Heather Brown, who's an independent gender and social inclusion consultant that um, uh, is assisting with um, Jesse and monitoring and evaluation on the fund. Um, we're going to hear from case studies from SNV, um, Bhutan, Laos and Nepal um, from Searing Choden, who's joining us from Bhutan today. And Searing is um, a gender and social inclusion advisor with SNV. Uh, we're all going to, also going to hear from um, Pip Robertson um, from Water Aid Australia, who's going to present um, with Sharon Pondros um, on their work um, in uh, Water Aid, um, Papua New Guinea. Sorry. Okay, so yeah, that's what we're going to cover today. So um, just after this introduction, um, uh, Joe Smart will provide an overview of gender and social inclusion um, in the Water for Women Fund, um, followed by Heather, who's going to outline approaches to gender and social norms change um, and reinforce for us why taking in, uh, a do no harm uh, approach is so important. Um, then I'm going to talk about monitoring approaches for unintended consequences. Um, using some, uh, some sort of broader concepts and examples from the Water for Women Fund. And then we're gonna look at some real life examples from projects. So those um, projects that I mentioned from SNV, uh, Nepal, Laos and Bhutan, and also Water Aid PNG. Uh, that's gonna provide basis for some, uh, then some reflection um, and lessons that we can draw out from those case studies. And we're gonna look at some, well, Therapy. Okay, so just a bit briefly about the Water for Women Fund. Um, so, um, yeah, the fund is spanning um, 15 countries. Um, it is funding around 18 um, civil society organisations. Uh, sorry, 15 civil society organisations are implementing 
um, 19 projects. It's being implemented over five years from 2018 to 2022. Um, and ultimately, it's expecting to reach around nearly 3 million um, people across um, the Indo-Pacific region with water sanitation and hygiene projects. Um, so the aim of those projects is to improve the health, the quality and well-being um, of Asian and Pacific communities. Um, and there's also a research component to the fund as well, where there's 11 um, projects that are being funded um, in research organisations uh, to support the uptake and use of knowledge and evidence within the water sanitation and hygiene sector and beyond. Okay, so see, these are some of the organisations that we're working with in the fund. So you can see um, some Australian based um, non government organisations and not for profits, um, as well as some um, international organisations. Uh, NGOs and civil society organisations that we're working with, as well as a range of universities. So it's quite a, it is quite a broad fund uh, in terms of its reach and the range of organisations that we're working with. So just briefly, um, yeah, so today's topic is about unintended consequences. We're going to get into that, but um, these are our intended um, uh, outcomes and goals for the program. So obviously this is our sort of starting point um, so we've got four main outcomes that we're trying to achieve in water sanitation and hygiene in the fund. Um, the first um, outcome relates to system strengthening for water sanitation and hygiene. So that's really about providing the enabling environment by government, civil society and the private sector to support um, inclusive and sustainable wash services. So that then provides the impetus there for the, the second outcome, um, which is about uh, in increasing access to water sanitation and hygiene services. So this is a, a core kind of outcome for us. Um, it's all about um, providing um, accessible, inclusive and sustainable uh, water and sanitation and hygiene. So the third outcome, which we're gonna focus largely on today is about strengthening gender equality and social inclusion. Um, and so this is related to, um, I think Jose is gonna get into this as well as Heather as well. And we'll hear from the real life examples from the projects, um, but it is about using um, water sanitation and hygiene as a mechanism um, for broader um, social and gender change. So the fourth outcome there is, as I mentioned before, is about strengthening the use um, of knowledge and evidence within and beyond the, um, the wash sector. Okay, so just to begin with, we're gonna just define these sort of, the term that we're using here. So for un unintended consequences, and you might notice that it actually differs from the um, original um, posting of this seminar. So we, we'd originally identified unexpected outcomes. So that's, uh, I guess, a term that we use in monitoring and evaluation quite often. But as part of putting together this seminar, we started to discuss it amongst ourselves as a team. And um, it was quite interesting to hear from uh, our sort of agenda advisors um, uh, in, on why when we take a do no harm approach, uh, we might actually use the, uh, the term of unintended consequences. So you can see here, there's lots of other, um, you know, words and terms that we could use. But I might just hand here to Searing, uh, Searing, if you're there on the line, uh, to provide us with a bit of um, background on why we're going to use the term unintended consequences. Yep, uh, thank you, Stuart. Uh, so yeah, as um, Stuart mentioned, um, we were having a discussion uh, amongst ourselves while we were preparing for this um, forum uh, discussion. And um, I think we came to the conclusion that uh, from a do no harm uh, lens, we actually like uh, unintended consequences because uh, it's more broad and inclusive, both um, in terms of uh, process and the results. And um, we also thought uh, that the term outcome, it sounds a bit too technical and uh, it loses out uh, on the human aspects of our development work. 
while um, consequence, it gives a more um, human touch uh, results uh, that we're aiming for. And also um, using the um, term consequence, uh, it makes us aware of the unintended harm that may uh, result from our actions. Yeah, so back to you, Stuart. Yeah, so we, are, we will use the term unintended consequences today. Um, but um, yeah, there are a range of other terms there. And I think with that comes um, different perspectives um, and ways of looking um, at um, not only what we identify as unintended, but then how, how we might um, approach them and monitor them in our work. So, so why monitor, monitor unintended consequences? And I think, I think there's fairly broad um, agreement um, within the evaluation field today, as well as within uh, social programming, that it's important. I mean, if you look at a lot of the policy debate around COVID, uh, it's highly um, topical to talk about uh, the unintended consequences of um, lockdown and all the sorts of measures that are going on at the moment. So, but what, why should we monitor unintended consequences? And I think there's two main reasons when you look at some of the general type of literature on the subject. And the first one is that there's a normative reason. So this is the, this is the moral, there's a moral and ethical dimension to this, that it's the right thing to do. So if we're gonna intervene in people's lives and environments, then we have a minimum responsibility to mitigate any negative or adverse effects that might arise from that. So the other sort of more um, related, pra practical, pragmatic reason um, is that it actually just leads to better decision-making and program if we look at um, the, the broader effects of our work, not those only within the frame that are set up uh, at the beginning of um, you know, the design of programs. So yeah, related to that, if, if we don't monitor the unintended consequences of our work, um, we run the risk of not um, capturing our achievements. Um, so this is something that um, funders are usually interested in, managers as well, and people that are delivering programs um, so yeah, you do see it coming into the commissioning of evaluations too. Um, however, when we're looking at unintended consequences, and Carol Weiss made this point a long time ago, is that they often tend to be negative. And that's because when we're, we're funding, designing, uh, delivering, monitoring and evaluating programs, we do have a tendency to look for things that are working and for positive. Um, obviously there's a lot of pressure um, on programs to deliver results as well. And I'm sure you're all well aware of that. So um, it is something that can get um, left ignored um, despite fairly broad recognition that it's something that we should all be doing. So um, I think with all of that, that's why we would argue that taking do no harm approach is critical um, for um, monitoring and evaluation uh, social programs. So with that, I'm going to hand to my um, colleague, Joyce, who's going to talk about Do No Harm within the Water for Women Fund. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart, and great to be here this afternoon and uh, share with you a bit about uh, Jesse on the Water for Women Fund. I'm here to talk about it, uh, particularly as it relates to Do No Harm, which Stuart and Sering have already kind of given a very good lead in about. Um, basically, we're, we recognise that gender and social inclusion is central uh, to the fund, recognising that sustainable, inclusive and accessible water sanitation and hygiene for all depends on equality in decision-making, in equal decision-making, participation, representation, and leadership of women, men, people with disabilities, and people from marginalized communities. Um, as our fund partners will tell you, and as you will see from the two case studies in today's presentation, supporting people to come 
from the margins to the centre in community and inst institutional decision making requires consistent and intentional work at all levels, including at the personal and the organisational levels. Next one, thanks Stuart. So this intentional work is outlined in the Funds Towards Transformation Strategy, uh, which was a collaborative development uh, by and for fund partners to, to, for their work in driving transformative practice and change in their WASH programs. Uh, the strategy outlines seven guiding principles, which you can see um, on this slide, um, holding ourselves accountable, doing no harm, of which is the focus for today's discussion, understanding and challenging power and privilege, addressing inevitable resistance and backlash, thinking and acting holistically, and placing the right people at the centre, of which um, you know, are, are obviously women, men, people with disabilities and from marginalised groups, um, and also pushing the boundaries of transformative practice. Um, so if, and also if you would like to know a bit more about the strategy, you can uh, find it on our website, a summary version, which the link will be provided at the end. Um, but for the purpose of this, you can see that they're, they're all interlinked and all are relating to Do No Harm. Thanks, Stuart. So Do No Harm. It's a core focus of the fund's work, which Stuart and has already talked about. Um, and so I just wanna, in this side, briefly step you through why. Power dynamics and social inequalities in every context means that the benefits of WASH are not equally shared. So to ensure better quality of and access to WASH services, women and the marginalized need to be supported for increased agency and voice in decisions that affect them and their communities. But empowerment of women and marginalised, and the marginalised can come at a cost if we do not proactively address the backlash and the resistance and the potential harms involved in challenging entrenched norms that support gender and social inequalities. So do no harm is very much about preempting and addressing the risks of harms in contextually appropriate ways. A key point to make here that, um, and that Heather will be expanding on in her presentation is that doing nothing is actually doing harm. Um, but just quickly, before we go on to the next slide, I'd like to outline just some of the intentional do no harm strategies that fund partners are employing. Uh, these include engaging male leaders in the WASH sectors, partners of change or for change, working closely with rights-based organizations such as uh, women's organizations, disability organizations, organisations working with L the LGBTQI plus community and, um, and also organisations that have, have a focus on gender-based violence. It's also, they're also looking at considering the burden of care for women. Uh, you know, so that's examples of that may be ranging from engaging men in discussions of household and wash work or targeting men in hand washing campaigns equally to women. Uh, an important one too, of which one of the case studies is about, is training staff on managing disclosure and referral of cases of violence, and which as we know is particularly important in, in the context of what has become known as the shadow pandemic of gender-based violence under COVID, under the COVID context. Thanks, Stuart. Now, before handing over to the, to Heather, I'd just like to brief. I'd like to briefly turn our attention to two tools that the fund has started to use for supporting reflective practice and quality data collection, of which we see are two important ways for examining transformative change. I won't go into too much detail on the slide, as it also features in Pitt's case study, but I just wanted to show it as a precursor to the next slide, as this is how. This is a framework that we're using for actually scoring in our self-assessment tool that we've developed. So this is a, this is a snapshot of our self-assessment tool and which has been designed to support fund partners to reflect on their JESSE practice in their WASH projects and in their organisations, which um, obviously very interlinked. Um, 
And as, as Stuart took you through the four fund outcomes, this tool focuses on the four fund outcomes plus um, an organisational component. So there are standards and criteria for each. And this just shows you an example from outcome three, which is the explicit, the, the outcome explicitly focused on gender and socially transformative change. So just to have a quick look through that as an example. And lastly, thanks, Stuart. The next year is stories of transformation. So this forms some of the qualitative data that we collect at fund level to examine how change is happening, particularly around practice and norms. Um, so as you can see, it includes a range of guiding questions that are very much MSC inspired. And um, these questions help us to think through the change, whether the change is about a process or an outcome, if there's been any unintended consequences, be they negative or positive, or both, um, how the change has happened, who was involved, who benefited, and what evidence is there to demonstrate this change. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Heather. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, so we wanted to talk about uh, gender norms in this uh, in this discussion because it's one of the areas in the fund we're really thinking about. Um, we're really thinking about yeah harm uh, in terms of both challenging gender norms, which we know in good uh, gender and social inclusion programs that we are challenging gender and social norms and that we need to think about what the unintended consequences might be. And these are in two areas. They are in reinforce, reinforcing unequal norms and also resistance to, to norms being challenged. So in the first point, um, you know, it's kind of what, what uh, Joe was saying within that spectrum of harmful practice through to transformative practice. When we don't look at norms, then you have the risk, you run the risk of reinforcing them. Um, and within uh, gender and social norms, it's how people are expected to behave in a society. And there are, I guess, sort of penalties for people who go against, go against that. Um, so yeah, so a risk of reinforcing norms. And in, in the WASH context, that can look like, um, you know, focusing behavior change programs or, you know, focusing hand washing and hygiene on women and focusing sort of maintenance and anything with tools and leadership with men. So that's what we want to think about how to, how to break out of those areas and push against them. The, so we'll go to the next slide. The challenge when you do push against norms, um, particularly gender norms, but we can look at all social norms, they, it does push against power and there can be reluctance to give up power. And then that does result in what we say resistance and backlash. Um, it is a paradox because if you are doing gender programming and social inclusion correctly, you are pushing against those norms and you will get resistance. So that is the paradox and why you have to really think about and plan for this resistance. And within the, the fund, in, within the tra um, towards transformation strategy, it talks about the expected resistance. So we expect this to happen. Um, so I would say that, yeah, it's just an interesting, and I see that there's some of my uh, gender advisor colleagues on, on the call today, and anyone who works in gender or social inclusion knows this, that a lot of our work is around, um, around resistance. Uh, the resistance can take quite a passive form to just kind of not really doing what we say we're going to do, or just kind of not showing up to workshops, to quite serious um, backlash and increased violence against women, particularly in countries in the Pacific where we already have high prevalence and um, Pip is gonna talk about some of the strategies around that. <clears throat> um, so I'll go to the next one, please, Stuart. Uh, we're looking at two frameworks here for thinking about um, ch challenging norms. There are many, many frameworks. We're looking at because these are two commonly used <clears throat> frameworks. One is within sort of violence against women prevention and the other, uh, the gender at work framework okay. is, is both a, a, an organizational change framework, but also a way to look at um, gender challenging gender norms. 
Um, and the, both of these frameworks underpin the water for women theory of change. So if you look at the gender at work framework, if we look at the bottom quadrant, there is sort of a mirror between the formal rules and policies and the informal norms. And an example of this is, you know, in a lot of workplaces, we might have policies that encourage men to take leave when they have children and do flexible work. I mean, all flexible work has changed as a result of COVID, but um, where we encourage men to take leave, but it's not the norm and it's not practiced. So it's having to look at these two to do things at once, looking always at the formal, but then how it's also what the informal rules are. Um, and they're quite hidden. So that's it. We just need to analyze those. Okay, we'll go to the next one, please. And here's just a few kind of, there's a lot of learning in the fund. This area of norms change is quite, it's quite new in some areas or challenging norms. And I'd say particularly, it's been interesting within the wash sector to really look at, um, yeah, how to challenge gender and social norms within a wash context. Uh, there has been a lot of reports of partners saying that they are experiencing real challenges in delivering norms change programs. And, you know, again, it's down to that paradox. It thinks that you're actually on the right track if you are experiencing resistance. At the same time, when we see that, you know, we're running a very short program and norms are changing quickly, that's, that's not likely. And so there's a lot of confusion about sort of what is knowledge, what is attitudes, what is practice, and how to monitor changes in each of those areas, but it is quite a new area. Um, and so we're working with, you know, throughout the fund on how to really articulate those different changes and how to monitor them. Um, there is one other issue as well around data around challenging norms, particularly in terms of monitoring resistance can be both in M&E frameworks, but it can also come through in risk reporting, particularly if it's around cases of violence. So it needs kind of a holistic systems approach to really try to track where the different um, areas of resistance and actually some of that backlash is happening. And yes, and I'll hand over to Stuart to talk more about the monitoring and evaluation aspects, thanks. I think Joe's covered these strategies before that we're using in the fund. Yeah, so thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, so um, from a monitoring and evaluation point of view, um, this is a real challenge for us on how we um, how we identify, um, track, respond to unintended consequences in the program. Um, so there's lots of different sort of dimensions and reasons to that. Um, we're not probably gonna cover them all today, um, but just to say, I mean, I don't, we, don't, we don't really have the answer. So this is something that we're exploring and it's probably one of the motives, motivators for this presentation today. So, but if we take a starting point, going back to, you know, my preamble at the start, um, if we look at our intended outcomes alone, that actually won't tell us the full story of what's happening within our program. Um, so, and there is a tendency, there's a, 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 you know, a, the pitfalls of performance measurement. So if we just track indicators alone, that's actually not going to always, indicators, good indicators by their nature are actually quite reductive. So we will miss out on certain things. We do know um, that um, performance indicators can also obscure strategy as well. So by that, I mean, they can actually lead to adverse effects in themselves. And there's lots of examples of that. I mean, one possible example from our fund is um, we are tracking um, and paying attention to um, women's leadership that's being promoted through the fund. So if we just solely look at women's leadership within ignoring or perhaps missing the familial or the social, the community institutional dimensions of what that might entail. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that's an example of um, a good indicator, but then it's just gotta be uh, put within a social context. So um, we're not for a minute saying that we shouldn't monitor intended outcomes, let me make that clear. So um, our whole measurement system, our program is guided by intended outcomes. Um, it's what motivates us. Um, our wash indicators, so for water, sanitation, and hygiene that I mentioned before, 
um, they feed up directly into the sustainable development goals um, for um, water and sanitation. So similarly with our gender equality, this is what, these are the overarching, you know, um, vision for the fund. So we would argue though that um, our intended outcomes uh, in themselves aren't, aren't quite enough. So they're necessary, but not sufficient. So um, when we look at the DAC criteria, um, this is, I guess, something I've learned from other evaluators, um, taking an impact um, evaluation approach. So looking at um, the difference that we're actually making through our programming does give us, I guess, the framework for looking at unintended outcomes. And this is something that we're encouraging our projects to do um, at the moment through their midterm reviews. And I find it, it's a nice little thing for them to focus on beyond the bigger, um, broader, more hardcore um, questions that you need to look at with impact. It's something that they can hang on to now, and it has to have a very real consequence for their programming. So anticipating un unintended consequences, and I think this is gonna be really brought to life by the case studies. So I don't wanna to talk for too long on this, but um, in the evaluation world, so when we look at what the guidance is, basically Patricia Rogers says, um, we need to look at negative theories of change. So we need to look at, okay, when we look at the expected outcomes that we're seeking to achieve, we need to flip that. We need to put on the black hat and look at then, okay, well, what about when things don't go to plan? What are perhaps some negative um, consequences that might um, occur as a result of our work? She also says that we need to explore competing theories and perspectives. So by that, um, when we've got a bunch of people in a room sitting, um, sitting around coming up with programs, um, there does, there's usually dominant ways of looking at how things should work. So we need to look at, uh, Look a bit more broadly, I think, if we're going to um, start to consider unintended consequences in our programming. So one, you know, I guess um, very current way to do that is to use uh, systems thinking uh, to explore the interactions um, that occur through programs. So obviously programs aren't delivered in vacuums. When we do something, when we intervene in a system, that then has a knock-on effect on other parts of the system. So we might start to explore what some of those um, knock-on or ripple effects might be. At a very basic level as well, when we're um, delivering a program or that's new or emerging or developing, we may not have a very good understanding of what the theory of change might be. So by un identifying and monitoring unintended consequences. It can actually help us build uh, and develop our theory as we go. Okay, so just some general approaches for monitoring and evaluating um, unintended consequences. So obviously taking a localized approach um, that is actually responsive and adaptive, um, having uh, monitoring systems that are actually built and led by the people that are um, affected uh, and delivering programs is a key way that we can be responsive to those changes that are occurring in our programming. So Irena Goit uh, talks about seeking surprise um, in her thesis from over 10 years ago. And I think that's, that's really, really cool. And that's something that we've taken uh, and sort of, uh, well, we've, we've started to embed that within our stories of transformation to actually prompt our projects to look for things that are coming out they didn't actually expect that were surprising for them. So we can do this by looking to explore within our monitoring systems in addition to explaining, which is, the, I guess, the more um, traditional um, approach to indicator measurement and our evaluation. Some common methods that are sort of suggested for unintended consequences. You see most significant change come up a lot, obviously. So that this is a narrative storytelling technique that's very qualitative. Uh, going out and asking people what is in the program for you and why is that significant? Um, so that's something that is often mentioned, as, I mentioned, as Joe's mentioned, that's in some of our own narrative um, monitoring too. So just 
more, you know, MSC does take, a, I guess, an unstructured approach to um, uh, interviewing. Um, so you, I think other unstructured approaches like observation, um, basically, if you use interviewing for a, um, as an example, um, I think giving um, participants time and room to, um, and space to, to formulate their own responses. So not asking leading questions and that sort of thing. Outcome harvesting is also an approach that's being um, suggested. Um, so canvassing broad range of changes that might be occurring within a program, identifying specific things, and then working back from those sorts of changes to look at how, what sorts of mechanisms might have brought about those um, changes that we're observing and then linking them back to the program strategies. So your know, wide sampling, snowballing, not just working from the same list of usual um, suspects or key informants with our um, list of people that we're, we're going out to. Um, and snowballing is a way where we can do that, where we can um, work from a list and then look to expand that out um, through networks. Um, and then finally, in analysis, taking an inductive approach. So rather than having a predetermined set of coding um, that we're looking at within our um, data, actually take looking looking at the data in its own right, and then seeking to um, yeah seeing seeing what emerges from from that data. Okay, so that's my um, yeah general <laughs> more conceptual. Uh, approach to some of these, uh, this issue of unintended consequences. So now we're actually gonna hear from our projects and um, yeah, this is exciting. So we can actually bring some of this to life. So first I'm going to hand to um, Siri Choden uh, from SNV and uh, she's going to talk about her work uh, in Bhutan, Laos and Nepal. And following that, we will hear from Pip Robertson from Border Aid. Um, who will um, present on their work in Papua New Guinea um, on behalf of Sharon Pondros. Okay. Thank you, Siri. Um, so uh, good afternoon. So today, as um, Stuart mentioned, um, I'm sharing uh, SNV's experience in uh, planning for and um, monitoring unintended consequences in uh, the uh, Water for Women supported project areas in Bhutan. Laos and Nepal. So in this um, regional project, we are applying um, SNV's performance um, monitoring guidelines that monitor um, environmental safeguards and uh, unintended negative consequences um, for marginalized groups uh, in the context uh, that we work in. Next slide, please. So to give you a little um, context, uh, SNV's uh, Water Sanitation and Hygiene, uh, in short, I'll just say um, WASH. So um, SNV's uh, WASH program approach uh, is built on the ground of uh, Sustainable Development Goal 6 uh, to ensure availability and uh, sustainable management of uh, water and sanitation for all can uh, only be realized. Uh, when the human right to water and sanitation of all uh, people is fulfilled. And um, our approach recognizes uh, the local governments uh, in their jurisdictions um, uh, as the duty bearers. So we focus uh, in strengthening wash systems uh, through our capacity strengthening activities for everyone um, involved in the delivery and uh, use of water services. So these may be um, government officials at the national or uh, local levels. It could be private sector players, uh, civil society organizations and community leaders and also um, users themselves. Um, in addition, uh, our programs are designed to ensure that uh, war services are environmentally and financially sustainable. So far, our uh, rural war services has been implemented across um, 19 countries in uh, Asia and uh, Africa. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it is critical uh, to understand that uh, WASH programming can unintentionally harm people uh, that are already discriminated against um, due to their gender, sexuality, um, disability, mental health, or uh, other forms of potential disadvantage. 
And uh, this is in addition to the potential harm of uh, poorly designed conceived infrastructure that we may typically uh, think of in WASH. Um, the risk of harm is heightened uh, when WASH programming seeks to redress uh, deeply entrenched and um, harmful norms and practices uh, such as gender roles in WASH. Uh, so these actions, um, while uh, good in their intent, result in backlash and violence, as uh, Hadil mentioned, uh, directed at the very people uh, the project intends to support. So um, understanding and uh, mitigating what uh, these potential risks are is critical to realize some um, inclusive development and social changes that everybody. To mitigate um, risks across our three project areas, we integrated the uh, do no harm principles in our program design uh, in 2018. Uh, and uh, since that time, together with our partners, uh, we have been uh, iteratively strengthening our do no harm approach in programming, do no harm um, experts, and carrying out um, trainings um, uh, for our partners and engaging in a do no harm uh, self assessment tool. So SNV's uh, do no harm approach uh, in WASH programming, it's uh, motivated by three objectives. So these are number one, um, to increase SNV's institutional commitment and capacity to integrate a do no harm approach. Uh, number two, uh, to understand um, context specific uh, causes of disadvantage uh, and modify programming and practices uh, to reduce harm and promote uh, gender and social inclusion. And uh, thirdly, uh, to build monitoring and uh, accountability mechanisms to capture unintentional negative impacts of programming and for continued um, learning and adaptation. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, led by uh, SNV in Bhutan, our uh, Water for Women funded projects uh, in the three countries of South Nepal and uh, Bhutan are contributing to deepening um, government and CSO commitment to inclusive development and uh, making this um, actionable. So together, we're setting up uh, context appropriate uh, environmental safeguards uh, to leave no one behind um, and ensure that uh, water sanitation and hygiene is accessible uh, for all. Uh, next, please. So uh, to illustrate, um, SNV's uh, programming starts with the collection, um, analysis and use of uh, disaggregated data by gender, wealth and disability. Uh, to inform the design of a sanitation and hygiene uh, impact uh, indicators. Um, number crunching is complemented uh, by formative research, uh, formative qualitative research uh, to understand the why and to help us devise the how um, to meet our objectives in a safe manner. To determine um, the capacity of the government, CSOs uh, and private sector to deliver um, environmentally safe and sustainable uh, and inclusive sanitation and hygiene, we carry out um, capacity assessments. Um, findings uh, of these capacity assessments uh, in turn identify those areas where capacity will need to be strengthened. So these uh, foundational exercises uncover the areas for improvement. So this included uh, the need to organize do no harm training courses for the project teams and national stakeholders. But uh, before carrying out training uh, courses ourselves, uh, we too at SNV uh, needed to discern how we were uh, faring in our do no harm approaches. So from the onset, we and applied our do no harm self-assessment uh, tool internally um, to assess our internal policies and organizational uh, functioning. When we were uh, ready to um, share our lessons, uh, we started conducting trainings for our partners. So during these trainings, um, we collectively identified um, the risks uh, sexual, psychological, um, social, cultural, and physical violence, uh, particularly uh, for people who may be marginalized um, due to their gender, sexuality, disability, or mental health. And then these themes later became um, prominent uh, themes in our program. Um, uh, to strengthen our uh, existing gender and social inclusion um, trainings, the Bhutan and Laos uh, project teams integrated uh, do no harm concepts and facilitated um, the greater uh, participation of marginalized uh, people in program designs and implementation uh, by forming strategic uh, partnerships with uh, local right holder groups. So um, such efforts have led uh, to the visible um, inclusion of uh, long marginalized identities um, in decision-making processes. Like for example, uh, in Bhutan, 
um, the project uh, team supported uh, the active uh, participation of disability champions um, during the national wash uh, multi-stakeholder forum by collaborating with uh, local uh, DPOs and also um, investing in preparation sessions uh, to strengthen their engagement and voice in the uh, WASH workshops. So from these efforts, um, two disability champions, a woman um, and a man, uh, they've emerged and uh, their active participation um, resulted in the uh, signing of a resolution uh, to ensure that the next national um, WASH stakeholder meeting venue will uh, be accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, we also wanted to make ourselves and our partners in decision-making and uh, planning uh, for inclusive WASH programming. So in Bhutan and Laos, we've developed the uh, Do No Harm Self-Assessment Tool that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, now being utilized uh, to measure progress uh, and to inform program adaptation uh, as needed. So the self-assessment is undertaken uh, every six months. It uh, provides uh, teams with the um, opportunity uh, to reflect uh, on the implementation of our um, do no harm commitment to assess uh, progress and uh, to identify where um, direct improvements uh, need to be made. So uh, part of the intended um, uh, assessment process in country management teams uh, committing to the process and signing and also um, endorsing the goals and next steps uh, in, in our formal uh, meeting uh, process. So for some of our uh, program initiatives, uh, especially at the central levels, we've also reached out to um, the sexual and gender minority community uh, through their own traffic networks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of uh, lessons and reflections, our um, do no harm experience have um, until now highlighted the importance uh, to strengthen risk assessments and programming applied um, integrating actions that promote participation and um, inclusion of people who may be marginalized. So understanding the complex uh, realities of people's life, uh, lives, especially um, power relations in any uh, given local context is crucial um, to ensure that WASH services uh, do not leave anyone and uh, so is the understanding that uh, the right people to talk to at the right time and also using um, appropriate and effective uh, methods and approaches. Additionally, um, we, we realize that we need to um, continue to strengthen government capacity to design, implement, monitor, and uh, be accountable for evidence-based and um, targeted WASH programs. So these initiatives, uh, they need to be uh, accompanied by long-term and investment uh, invested empowering initiatives uh, with the most marginalized, like for example, uh, people with disabilities and their households um, through the development of uh, respectful engagement approaches and decision making or designing WASH uh, interventions. Uh, we believe that uh, the continuous application of the do no harm approach with aligned actions uh, to improve practice uh, will deliver um, incremental uh, improvements in ways that uh, sustain good organizational and uh, professional practice and uh, enables lasting change with benefits uh, for all. Um, next slide, please. So lastly, um, if you're interested to learn more about SMB's um, Do No Harm work, please uh, refer to the learning briefs that uh, we've developed so far uh, that's available on our website. Um, thank you so much uh, for your attention. And uh, with that, I'll um, hand over to Pip. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Saring. It was really interesting to hear the work that you've been leading. And I think it flows in really well um, to taking a close look at some of the work that we've been doing in WeWAC. So my name's Pip Robertson. I'm the Equality and Inclusion Officer at Water Aid Australia, so based here in Melbourne. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I'm on. I'm working from home at the moment and I'm in the northern suburbs of Melbourne uh, on the land of the Wurundjeri and Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And on behalf of Water Aid, I would like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I think it's acknowledging uh, traditional owners is really important. Um, in Water Aid's commitment to reconciliation and also um, when we're having a conversation like this about do no harm, I think 
that's really pertinent. So as Stuart said, um, I'm based in Melbourne and I've got my colleague Sharon Pondros, who is the Gender Equality, Disability and Social Inclusion Officer, who's based in the WeWAC office in PNG. Sharon has really been the driving force behind all of this work and I really want to acknowledge um, the incredible work that she's put into this and the way that um, she's led this um, integration of family violence referral pathways with our partner. And unfortunately, she was going to be presenting tonight, but she's not been able to join us. So you have me instead, but hopefully I'll be able to bring through some of her insights and reflections this evening. So WaterAid uh, is a WASH organisation working that everybody has good quality and safe water sanitation and hygiene. So everyone everywhere. And then um, speaking about our Water for Women program, the Water for Women program is really focused on inclusive wash for the WeWAC, WeWAC region in the East Sepik province. So as you can see there, it's quite a, a regional area in Papua New Guinea. Um, so as part of the inclusive wash program, we're looking at reaching over 40,000 people and the real focus being on inclusive, equitable, water sanitation hygiene services, taking that sector strengthening approach that Stuart was talking about earlier, with a really strong focus on the empowerment of women and people with disabilities through the creation, participation, support, engagement um, of those groups in wash service delivery and leadership roles. So as the third point says, lots of partnership work. We've got amazing partners with the ECIPIC Council of Women and also with the ECIPIC Disability People's Organization. We just pop to the next slide. So today I'm going to be talking about our do no harm approach in this programming and how we've applied it to our COVID-19 response. And I'm sure that everybody um, can see or feel the way in which COVID has really hit women and girls really hard and that um, WASH is more important now than ever because so many of those key prevention behaviours rely on WASH, that having access to water and soap as that prevention measure. But for only 37% of the population in WeWAC, um, only 30% of 37% have access to basic drinking water or their water supplies unreliable or that they're not able to get as much water as they need. And that's been a real barrier. Um, and the other piece being that during COVID we've, I think research widely has shown that um, it's had a major burden for women because many women are locked out of decision-making. So their needs aren't being met, that they've, women have had a lot of increased labor, particularly for women in WeWAC with wash labor and also increase, increasing of violence against women and girls. So when we look at our do no harm approach for water aid, it's been a real journey, a real transformation journey for us as an organization. And that's what underpins the work that we're doing now. So it's been that gender framework, which is where our do no harm principles come from and also undertaking a gender audit, safeguarding review training that's really underpinned our programming work. So when we talk about do no harm, we're talking about ensuring that our work isn't directly causing harm. And as Heather was talking about, also that we're not reinforcing negative harmful social norms and stereotypes. So that's really where the work that um, Sharon has been leading in the PNG team comes through today. So when COVID hit, we had to react really quickly. And it was, um, and government came to us wanting to partner with WaterAid, the partnerships we, that we have to be able to respond. And there's some key pieces that we'd already done as part of our Water for Women programming that really underpinned our ability to respond quick, quickly. So a key component of that was the analysis and research that we'd undertaken as part of that baseline. So understanding the experiences and needs of women, girls, people with disabilities. Um, and that was undertaken through the National Research Institute to understand what, what marginalized communities were experiencing in terms of their wash needs and in terms of the social norms that were a barrier to both equality and wash. 
And they highlighted similar things around being locked out of leadership, um, not having their needs met, not having their voices heard, and experiencing gender-based violence when they're trying to access WASH services, um, and as well as carrying a really big burden around, um, around WASH, collecting water, washing clothes, um, being the person that needs to get the drinking water for the family. So that really heavy WASH burden. The other thing that we know is that PNG has very high rates of violence. So two thirds of women over the age of 15 have experienced violence in a relationship and that the social norms that go with that. So this data is coming from the census, the PNG census, that 70% of women and 72% of men agreed that violence was acceptable in certain circumstances. The other really crucial information was that women who experience violence, very few tell anybody or are able to access help. So that information really underpinned the approach to our programming and particularly our rapid response to COVID-19. The other essential part is partnerships for us. So we work with ECPIC Council of Women that are a network of 20,000 amazing women across, across the district. And they also deliver family violence services. So in terms of how do we take the do no harm approach and how did we use that for our COVID work? So as I mentioned, our government partners came to us wanting to respond um, to COVID and be doing that prevention. Um, and so when we were thinking about what is the best practice that we know about WASH and COVID prevention, we were thinking about two key elements so that we knew that the essential pieces of hand washing, social distancing, cough etiquette, um, and thinking about when we apply a gender lens, what does that look like? And again, how do we ensure that with those elements, we're not reinforcing gender norms? Um, and one of the really key things that's come up through COVID is that with social distancing, it's a really common tactic that underpins family violence. So isolating a victim is a key part of what a perpetrator will usually do when they're using violence against um, a woman or usually a woman. Um, and so what does that mean when we're going out and we're promoting um, hand hygiene, social distancing, when we apply that gender lens, what does that mean? And how do we apply the do no harm approach? How do we mitigate some of the risks that come with that? And it was through those partnerships that it was really clear what some of the needs were. So really talking with SKL Council of Women, it was really clear what some of the needs coming out from community were and the very strong concern around family violence that came through very, very clearly, which is why this piece of work has come up. Stuart, can you go to the next slide for me, please? So you can see there those critical pieces that I was talking about and there's an SCAL member, Florence. And next slide, please, Stuart. So then talking about the COVID prevention work, so how we put this into action. So WaterAid worked with the, uh, the district government in mobilising six teams to go out and undertake COVID prevention response work. So as part of that, we worked with our partners. So we worked with SCAL to develop some key gender equality messaging and also to include some messaging around family violence referral pathways. So if you look on the right there, you can see a poster which was co-designed with SCAL and women about what are the key messages that they wanted to be sharing with other women to enable other women to be getting help, but also the messaging about working together, about reinforcing positive social norms that men and women can work together, they can create safer communities, that with these prevention measures, that there are ways to protect the community and be safe together. So this is often called the Harmonious Communities poster, looking at ways to reinforce positive social norms. So with the mixture of positive gender equality messaging, the poster, which includes all the referral hotlines for COVID and family violence, and um, the SCAL members delivered some quick fire support to these government units that were going out, as well as SCAL members attending. So they went out for weeks at a time, delivering these messages in communities. So the slide before you saw Florence doing exactly that. 
so that contextual local partners delivering messaging within their communities about how to seek support if they needed it, but also reinforcing positive gender norms about sharing household work, sharing labour, how to use nonviolent norms to resolve stress and conflict. The other piece that uh, we did was uh, develop a train the trainer, and that was used by 180 government staff. It's a five day train the trainer that was uh, supported by the World Health Organization in PNG. And throughout that manual, it is based in scenarios that unpack the gender elements of, uh, of COVID, of the WASH behaviour, also talks about the risks of family violence and how people could provide a safe referral. So whilst WaterAid wasn't able to go out and do all of this work ourselves, taking that system strengthening approach, we could share some strategies that people could do but also try and minimise the risks. So really focusing on applying the gender lens and understanding that some of those preventative measures can have implications and how to speak to communities about that, making sure that they understood the services that were available. And then also um, um, being confident to speak about family violence in a culturally appropriate way delivered by people from that community. So we did some monitoring on this as well. So this is a little bit different to our standard programming where we would have really long running relationships in communities because this was supporting government to go out into other communities. It was, it's been more difficult than if you're working in a community for an extended period where you could go back and speak with people. But we were able to do some monitoring by talking to teams who delivered the messaging and they said that the impact was really positive that women spoke out during these wash sessions where we're talking about prevention measures or we're talking about wash and women women really speaking out passionately and saying yes that's so true like we're doing all this work and we'd love support and then starting those community conversations and also women reporting that they felt really supported by having organizations talk about women's rights and um and and speaking about family violence not being um, appropriate way to resolve conflict or that family violence isn't appropriate and it is um, against women's human rights. So we had really positive feedback from women talking to SCAO through communities. We had reflection sessions with government staff afterwards and we also had some data come in from SCAO about the referral pathways when they were doing family violence intakes and um, and that they had quite a few sort of over 30 referrals from women saying we attended one of your sessions and that's how we got the number and and seeking out family violence support so we can already see what some of some of the impact is so just to finish i hope that i've been able to bring some of that work to life about how we've approached that and really highlighted the key learnings or the the key essential elements around working with rights groups partners that have that local context and knowledge, um, ensuring, ensuring that there are, for when you're doing gender equality or family violence work, that the services are available. If there aren't any services, you're potentially putting people at really high risk of experiencing violence and not being able to access services. That's really critical. Um, and also supporting staff to be able to speak about it, um, having those skills about how to manage a referral so we're going to be progressing this family violence work in our longer term um, programming with communities that we're working with more longer term in terms of um, improving water sources, community engagement, women's leadership and water committees. So this work will continue, but I hope that gives you a snapshot as to how we integrated that work into the COVID response. Um, I think it's been really meaningful and it's, it's really been led by the WeWAC team and by our partners. Um, and I know that they're really proud of it. So thanks. Thank you, Pip. Um, and also Searing, that was wonderful to hear your um, project examples of do no harm in practice. Okay, um, so now just some broad um, 
uh, from the fund and also drawing on the projects to um, uh, steering Joe's Heather um, please chime in um, you could probably do this much better justice than I can um, so just some sort of takeaways from for us really um, in exploring this topic um, so really um, identifying considering um, exploring and addressing gender and, gender and social norms in our um, programming um, is critical. And I think the um, project examples have highlighted how that um, is something that is an ongoing process, um, but it's something that needs to be addressed head on um, at the design stage. And um, Searing's example of the formative research that was done that then um, provided the basis for then the ongoing programming um, and similarly, I think with Pip's examples of um, doing needs assessment um, in WeWAC, um, uh, yeah, is really uh, great examples of how gender analysis can provide the basis for the, for the programming. Um, from a um, yeah, male perspective, um, yeah, really, I, I mean, you see this in the programming too, um, taking a really adaptive, contextually appropriate, um, responsive approach um, so really having locally led, locally driven um, implementation um, and then building and monitoring systems around that um, is key, I think, um, if we're going to anticipate and respond to things that are coming out um, of our interventions. So one fun level um, reflection, I guess, that we've had, uh, we just had a whole a review of the whole fund um undertaken um, and it based one of the findings was that i think that we can do better in terms of um, bringing our results um, into back into the practice and the implementation of our fund and that's not that's not a, um, an issue that we have alone for our fund um, i think adaptive management adaptive programming is a challenge um, for the entire you know for, for most programs um, so Really, yeah, again, trying to embed um, those, um, yeah, those cycles between uh, planning, um, reflecting, um, and then um, feeding, you know, and doing um, into our programming. Um, yeah, so another reflection is to, to monitor process as well as outcomes. So this, this came out of, um, yeah, our early discussions, as Searing mentioned at the beginning, I think it's also really well highlighted by those um, examples. So um, in the PNG um, water aid project, um, we, we need to look at all the, and similarly with the, the SNV projects, we need um, ways of monitoring the processes of our information uh, implementation too. If we just wait for the results to emerge, um, that may be too late. And that in itself can present risks. Um, for um, the people that we're working with, particularly when we're talking about working with marginalised people, which aren't, which may not be represented in our um, data in, in the first place, if we're talking about um, hidden or um, vulnerable groups. Um, this is probably even yeah, heightened in a COVID context where you've got social stigma. Um, so we're talking, um, yeah, it really does just reinforce, I think, for both dual processes, monitoring process and outcome as well. Um, one thing- uh, Sorry, Stuart. Yes, Sorry, please, Joyce. Just, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I just wanted to emphasise, I think what you um, highlighted there is really important and, and key to that, that um, inclusive process is, ensuring inclusive processes is, is around that, that, and Pip and both Pip and Sarah talked about this a lot around the engagement and the work done with, um, uh, rights-based organisations and, you know, that, that, that really strong work to ensure that those processes are inclusive. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that was a key thing that came out for me from the two case studies. Yep. yep. Thanks, Joyce. So, yeah, a challenge that we found um, for our fund, again, it's not limited to our um, project um, is yeah the risk of positive bias um, in not only identifying 
um, our results, but then, um, yeah, the processes of selecting and reporting and communicating as well. Um, we had roughly 25 stories of transformation that came in um, from projects earlier this year, and I think nearly all of them were um, positive. Um, and so that's why um, it does reinforce the need for um, qualitative, qualitative narrative storytelling techniques like most significant change to be part of a broader um, measurement system that includes mixed methods. So where we can um, track and report on our known indicators and then explore other emerging um, uh, things too as well. And obviously that needs to happen within a context, a fun context where we're supporting um, learning to an improvement. So I don't feel like I've done justice to the, the richness of those case studies at all. Um, so hopefully we can probably draw some of that in discussion. Hopefully we've still got some time. Um, I might just hand over to um, Heather and Joyce now, who've actually who've got some um, tools and resources that they could share with you on Do No Harm. Sure, um, I'll just start. Yeah, in, uh, back in, you know, when we were talking about resistance and the different forms of resistance from sort of, you know, more passive resistance to more, um, you know, sort of um, backlash and, and um, stronger resistance. There's a really good tool by Vic Health, which actually goes through the different forms of resistance and different strategies needed to address them. So that's just a, a toolkit that I think is really helpful in terms of not only strategies, but I think once you work through the strategies, you work through that mitigation and how, how you might apply that in a program setting. Um, International Women's Development Agency has developed a really interesting uh, do no harm toolkit that was based on, I would, I don't know, a couple of years of re like really in depth research looking at, um, at women's economic empowerment and some of the in unintended consequences around women having greater access to, um, to financial resources, both in actually having access to cash, but also the, I guess, changes in dynamics at the household level. And it's a really great, um, very um, intuitive kind of toolkit. Um, I don't know, Joe, did you want to talk about that in the fund, how it's been used? Yeah, oh, I can just quickly, uh, just a quick word on that. That Yeah, that was, um, that we uh, applied that Do No Harm toolkit, toolkit in a pilot that we did with one of our partners, Habitat for Humanity in Fiji. Um, to, yeah, it was a pilot that involved uh, working with the staff on um, key concepts around violence against women and, and how that impacts on um, their ability, capacity to participate and how that would affect, the, the, the barriers to that would affect their participation in WASH processes when the staff go to the communities to, to to develop WASH plans um, uh, collaboratively with the communities. And so it involved a process of sensitizing staff to those issues in Habitat and also uh, supporting them to apply some of the, um, the tools in the Do No Harm Toolkit, um, integrating them into their WASH planning processes with the communities. Uh, so yes, yeah, so there is a, a learning brief that you can, um, you can find on that on, on the website if you're interested. But yeah, yeah. I, I second what Heather's saying. It's, it's a really great, great tool, very clear and um, based on really strong research as, as um, Heather raised. Um, there's another one which is it's got a, it's it's got quite a uh, a handful, but it's a GBV monitoring for non-GB programs basically. So it looks at how to um, mitigate gender-based violence um, issues around um, any kind of programming. So it's been it can be used in WASH, it can be used in women's economic empowerment, and it goes through uh, some of the systems that you know and processes that I think that. Kip was discussing and how WaterAid approached it is, you know, what are all the gender equality kind of implications, what are the norms, and then getting down to what are women's rights organizations, what are referral pathways, those kinds of things. So it's quite a step-by-step, -step. again, another really, um, a, you know, good, good resource. Um, and the final one is one I just came across in the past couple of weeks. And, you know, as we said, this norms area is still quite, um, 
you know, it's quite new. And there's a, a platform that's run by ODI um, out of the UK, which is all about, you know, resources around norms change and around, I guess, different frameworks and thinking and, and um, you know, behavioral insights. And, you know, it's, just, it's a huge area, but this is a really good um, kind of website that looks not just at m &E, but just, the, I guess, all the broader norms change kind of work. Joseph, do you want to say? Yeah, I can just quickly. Yeah, thanks, um, Stuart. Yeah, so this this is just to show some of the links um, for on on the Water for Women website, which um, also takes you to if you go to the second link, it takes you to the gender and social inclusion page, and there's also the publications page. These include all uh, many of the resources that um, our fund partners have developed through their Water for Women uh, projects and. Um, also includes a number of learning briefs, uh, the SMV ones, which Sering was referring to, and also some, some other learning briefs also um, from the fund around do no harm, uh, disability inclusion in COVID wash responses, and also um, inclusion of sexual and gender minorities in, in COVID wash responses as well. And that's also where you find the, the do no harm uh, learning brief uh, from the Fiji pilot as well. And there's a few other things there too, if you're interested. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. That's the end of our presentation. So on behalf of the fund, thank you. And I might hand to Charlie now. Do we have any time for um, any questions? Yeah, thanks, Stu. We do. Uh, so I've just put out a call in the chat for any questions. Otherwise, if anyone would like to directly jump on, uh, unmute yourself and ask a follow-up question, we can, can do that. Um, thank you, everyone, for presenting. It was really interesting. It's very different work in that context for many of us as evaluators uh, working here just in Australia. So really interesting to see this international collaboration taking place. And for my reflection on all, all of this, um, the do no harm language has, I guess, somewhat been used in the evaluation circles where as evaluators, we aim for our work to do no harm. So our aim in coming in and evaluating any intervention is to, to not make things worse and to conduct ourselves ethically. And it seems in this case that we've just looked at in the various projects and case studies here, that it's become an implementation approach to program delivery as much as just to just evaluation. Um, so I guess maybe the maybe my question to link it to a question is: um, Is this a normal way of operating that you've come across before, or is it normal in your sector to have a do no harm framework, or is that something relatively relatively new for you? Um. I think yeah, I think Charlie, that's um, yeah, that's that's a really good question, and I think it 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 it's it's not um, relatively new in terms of uh, the humanitarian context, uh, where the idea was to to be able to um, identify, you know, to ensure that you're not. Um, I think um, Pip described it well, saying you're not reinforcing um, or not causing harm in the interventions that you do. But I think it is probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, others, but it's emerging in the practice of um, really focusing on gender and social norms and, and, and addressing them in, in safe ways, recognizing that they do, you know, they are major contributors to inequalities. And so being able to address those um, is really important, but addressing them in safe ways that, um, that don't cause harm and being able to identify those um, from the outset is, is, is key. And I think that's, this is an emerging area. And um, under the fund, there's been, you know, this, this is a big, uh, this is one of the priority areas that, that um, some partners are working on and, and we're sharing and collaborating across the fund on that. Um, but others may have, um, 
you may have a different point of view around that. I mean, it's it's a question perhaps for, for those um, that have joined us. Are there other sectors um, that are mm. um, approach? Obviously, we've got our own, um, yeah, experience with this. I think, Pip, it might be a good, um, you know, I can see there's some questions here to talk about if it's being, uh, you know, um, used, this kind of approach has been used much in Australia. And I just know that, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know that, you know, previous to working in international mm -hmm. development, you, you were involved in, in the Australian sector. And if you have any comments on, on, on how it's approached in other, you know, outside of international development. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, I was just trying to think of some examples and um, I have I worked a lot in the Victorian sector at women's organisations. Mm. And I think that I did see do no harm approaches being used, particularly around prevention of violence against women and gender equality work, um, because it is around those social norms and thinking and not wanting to be reinforcing negative social norms in the work that we're doing. So it may not have always been called do no harm um, or unintended consequences, but I think that type of approach was definitely being used in a programmatic sense. Um, and certainly whenever we're talking about family violence, we talk about risk and mitigating risk and making sure that we're not increasing risk or potential um, harm or trauma when we're particularly when you're working with survivors um, of family violence or um, doing any type of work like I think say I worked on a technology project called Ask Izzy which is around connecting um, people experiencing family violence with um, services and a huge part of that was around how do we mitigate the risk of um, potential harm with technology and abuse so I think my reflection would be definitely happening um, but I'm just not sure if it's called or referred to in the same way but I'd be really interested to hear from other people um, if, if they've seen those kind of strategies. Okay. All right, that's really interesting. And that probably that answer comes up on another question around whether this method's been used in non-development or Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander program evaluation. Um, it's probably a live question. Did anyone have a comment in response to either the se seminar as a whole or a specific element of it or that topic just discussed? No, um, we only have a short amount of time, maybe just one more question or so. There's a comment in the chat area about, from Julian around working in the recovery program space. And um, did you want to talk to that comment quickly, Julian, or leave, leave others to have a read? All right, I'll leave that as a comment. Stu, did you want to close off with any other follow-up questions or, um, or or finishing statements? Not just to say that um, we're on a journey with this too. We're still learning, um, obviously, um, and that's why we've we've started to you know come and talk to you today about it. So. Um, if you'd like to discuss it further, if you have any ideas, if you'd like any information, um, please get in touch. We will circulate the, um, the presentation um, and that'll um, have our details attached in it too. Yep. All right. Excellent. Well, on behalf of the Victorian branch of the AES, thank you all very much for dialing in, including from abroad. Um, it's been great to hear this case example and um, learn about projects on the ground and the ways that behaviour change can be taken forward through implementation and evaluation. And, um, and good luck with the future work in this space. And uh, hopefully everyone can join us next month uh, for another seminar, which will be about evaluation careers and all your various careers options in the profession. So it should be an interesting way to end the year thinking about um, different opportunities that evaluators can progress and, and, and take steps into. 
So thanks everyone for dialing in and thanks, thanks Stu and team for presenting so well today. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.